Hello, I'm ABX Toycat, and welcome back to another History of Video. Today I'm going to be going through the history of consoles as a whole. I think it'd be kind of cool to talk about the start of consoles in the 1970s and how they kind of got to where they are today, and in particular, focus on the console wars. That's right, a lot of people think console wars are something fairly recent to last generation or the one before that, but truth be told, consoles have had this big competition with each other ever since they did first produ uh, start production in the early 1970s, and I think it'd be kind of cool to go through each generation and talk about who won the console war of that generation. So that's what we're doing in today's video. I think it'd be a cool concept. Hopefully you all do agree. If you do, please do a like the video and let me know because it helps out the channel a lot and let's know you do like this sort of history of content. And with that said, let's get straight into it, shall we? With the very start of consoles, which was in the early 1970s, like I mentioned. So this was uh, the, the very first uh, generation of consoles really were the start of what they called at the time interactive television, where you could actually interact with your TV and do something with it. That was a very revolutionary concept. Before this, you know, it was just a you know medium for playing stuff, uh, for actually watching stuff on it. But after the release of, uh, you know, the Magnavox Odyssey in 1970, 72 and consoles like home pong for the atari you could actually play games on your television now bear in mind that these consoles were very very rudimentary compared to today things and for the most part they were all programmed to play just the single game so for instance atari's home pong console released in 1975 and cost the equivalent of 400 dollars in today's money and all it played was this home pong game you know the standard thing you can all picture where oh there's a you know the a pong pong on each side of the screen but this was such a cool idea that you could actually play with each other like this and uh, as a result it sold hundreds of thousands of units despite costing 400 hundred dollars for just Pong and uh, that really is a sign of just how much things have changed because what you expect from four hundred dollars today is a little bit more than just Pong in my opinion so yeah a lot of consoles released this generation including one from Magnavox, one from Philips, one from Epoch, one from Binotone, one from Colorco and interestingly one from Nintendo. This Nintendo Color TV game series actually kind of won the generation because uh, basically the idea behind this was that you buy a console from Nintendo, this console has one particular game programmed in and uh, the first one Light Tennis was the most popular with over three million units sold but a lot of the other Color TV game consoles actually sold quite well too including one called Block Breaker, Racing 112 basically these games were very popular people liked Nintendo's games and as a result they kind of won the very first generation of consoles with their first you know kind of outing into the console game market so yeah that was uh, Nintendo winning the very first generation and this kind of launched the second generation because people saw people do want to buy these consoles you know Nintendo sold 3 million units and at several hundred dollars each that adds up to quite a lot of money as you can imagine so this meant that the second generation of consoles had quite a bit more interest than the first quite a few more consoles releasing as well as a lot more sales because they got more advertising and stuff and this really the second generation really was the first generation of consoles as we know them today because they switched from hard-coded microchips to actual uh, you know CPU units and if you don't know all the differences here it meant that instead of programming the console to play one particular type of game they programmed the console to be able to accept instructions from the cartridge this meant the cartridge could then contain the game and you could have 10 or 20 separate entirely different games uh, running on this same console and again that's the con that's the concept we know today as a video game console and it meant that the second generation of consoles were quite a bit more successful than the first because even though they cost a lot of money, you know, again, equivalent to several hundred dollars by today's standards, uh, they could actually do quite a few different things. So the most popular co uh, console of this generation was one from Atari because even though one released from Fairchild, Bailey, Magnavox, a lot of names that you probably won't know today besides perhaps Mattel, the Intellivision, uh, beh beside perhaps, uh, you know, the Atari, those are the most popular names you will know today and the 2600 was the most popular selling console of this generation, selling 30 million units versus its closest competitor, the Mattel Intellivision, at just 3 million. So yeah, basically the, uh, the Atari 2600 was kind of the winner of this generation. If you wonder what Nintendo are doing, because I haven't mentioned them at all, they were busy making uh, like handheld consoles, which we're not going to be focusing on in today's video, but the Game & Watch consoles released around this time, and that was really when the you know handheld market kind of decided to kick off, but that's when Nintendo are kind of absent here, as Atari did dominated the console market, first with the Atari 2600, then with the Atari 5200. And I think it'd be kind of cool, because this was the, was the first generation of like programmable consoles for the most part, I think it'd be kind of cool to compare the specs of the Atari 2600 against Again, selling 30 million units, which is roughly how many PS4s have sold right now, uh, compared to the PlayStation 4. So on the left here, we've got the uh, you know the Atari 2600 with its 1.19 megahertz CPU. It's 128 bytes of RAM. That's right, not gigabytes, not megabytes, not kilobytes. 128 bytes of RAM. That's the 128 ones or zeros, and then it's 160 by 192 output resolution. Just think it'd be kind of cool to take a quick comparison of how much things have changed in just the last 30 to 40 years alone. So with that said, yeah, that's the Atari 2600 versus the PS4. Even though Although it wasn't quite PS4 level, obviously t times changed, and as a result of that, the 2600 won that generation, and Atari has a little notch on their belt, so it's kind of like one versus one on the whole Atari versus Nintendo thing. However, the third generation of consoles is what wiped out Atari for good. You might be thinking, so if Atari did so well here, selling as much as the PlayStation 4 did today, where did they go? Well, the Atari 7800, which was their, you know, kind of start of the, uh, you know, the th third generation of consoles, didn't do quite so well as the two brand new competing systems, which both did incredibly well across all markets, and those two new consoles, 
titles, well, the Nintendo NES or the Famicom uh, in, in Japan, I believe it was, or the Sega Mark III or the Master System, as it's commonly known. And yeah, basically both these consoles did very well. The Nintendo mostly did well in the US and the, uh, the Sega generally did well in territories like Europe and like uh, Oceania. And as a result of that kind of big competition, both of these consoles kicked off and dominated the markets and every other console was kind of left in their dust. So yeah, even though there were a bunch more consoles released at the same time from Atari, from uh, Interactive Vision, from the Action Max, the Amstrad, uh, the Commodore 64 you might know, there was a bunch of different consoles. Really the two most significant ones were the Sega Master System and the Nintendo Entertainment System. And even between those two consoles, the difference was vast. The number of NES NESs sold, so NESs, uh, was 62 million uh, by the end of their reporting uh, uh, period, whereas the, uh, the number of Sega Master Systems sold was just 14.8 million, and even then, both of those just massively trumped the Atari 7800, which just sold 2 million, and then th that massively trumped everything else combined. So this kind of led to the point in the games market where we are today, where there are just a few major manufacturers, because it made sense. Once you bought a console, you didn't want to buy more than one, especially when, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the NES in particular had so many good first party titles. Why would you buy too many more consoles besides maybe a Sega? And that was uh, the kind of start of the exclusives, kind of selling the consoles as a whole. So that meant the fourth generation, uh, you know, Nintendo was going in pretty strong, having won the last one and having a success as that product in the form of the SNES. And uh, yeah, the SNES did very, very well this generation, not quite as well as the NES. Uh, but the, uh, again, so Sega realizing that they had kind of an edge in quite a few markets, decided to release their console first, decided to, you know, market this a lot, release Sonic the Hedgehog, that was a big uh, kind of moment as a big exclusive. And uh, as a result of this, they made some real inroads into the Nintendo marketing. Uh, even though uh, Nintendo, uh, the, the Super NES, uh, well, the, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, the SNES, did beat the Genesis by quite a bit, 49 million to 31 million. The kind of, the margin between the two was narrowing quite a bit. So the fourth generation of consoles was also one of the last times we saw just a random console from some other manufacturer do significantly well, and that was with the TurboGrafx-16. So you might not have heard of this, I know I hadn't heard of this until this video, uh, but the TurboGrafx-16 actually sold 10 million units, which although it's not quite as much as the, uh, the Mega Drive or the SNES, it entirely was massive amount bigger than the competition, and it was a reasonably successful third console, and I, just, I figured I'd mention that right there, even though it was kind of like this big, you know, war between Sega and Nintendo, and all the advertisements were like, oh yeah, we do what Nintendo, there was technically the Graphic 16 fighting alongside them, just this was the last time that really ever came up. So yeah, uh, this uh, was the start of console wars being a really serious thing, there was a whole bunch of advertisements during this time that you would have seen, uh, you know, of if Sega saying Nintendo sucked, or Nintendo saying Sega sucked, basically, because it really did come down to a big two-horse race about the exclusives, about the big selling consoles, and uh, yeah, that gets really interesting as we move into the fifth generation. So the fifth generation is one that's really close to my heart because these were the consoles that were released at roughly the same time as literally I was born because that was how that thing. So this was the first generation of consoles that I played as they were new, and uh, the big ones that you're gonna wanna pay attention to are Nintendo and Sega, continuing their rivalry with the Nintendo 64 and the Sega Saturn, but also interestingly, a brand new entrant from Sony with the PlayStation, which marked itself to a whole new audience of gamers, and as a result of that, massively outsold the two combined. So again, if you look at the Nintendo Sega thing, it was kind of like them continuing their competition with uh, Nintendo 64 having 32 million units, which would be a lot, you know, it would be really impressive had there not been the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn having 9.2 million, uh, as well as a bunch of other consoles, include the Jaguar with just a quarter million sales, the Amiga, the PCFX, a bunch of other consoles, including one from Apple, which sold just 40,000 consoles. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's kind of interesting the fifth generation, but for the most part, it was a free pronged race between PlayStation with over 100 million sales compared to Nintendo 64's 30 and compared to Sega Saturn's 9. So yeah, this was a generation where basically other consoles slipped out forever and really stopped having any relevance, and which PlayStation came in and for the first time just dominated their generation. So uh, right now, if you wonder what the scoreboard is, it's like, you know, Nintendo sitting at 3 and uh, Atari sitting at 1, PlayStation sitting at 1. Despite this being their first generation, they massively outsold everyone else, and it was one of the really impressive, like, feats of marketing. Because again, they just kind of marketed their console different, they had, uh, you know, discs, which meant they could do different things. They were just a more technically capable console in quite a few different ways, and as a result of their ability to actually market this to new people, and not just kind of kids in the same way Nintendo had, they did very, 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 very well in this kind of thing, and uh, really kind of expanded the, uh, the you know the, the sales of consoles as a whole, just with their single entrance into the market. So of course, when the sixth generation of consoles come round, the big eyes are all on uh, you know Sony uh, with for their PlayStation 2, and they delivered very very strongly because even though this next generation of consoles saw Microsoft come in for the first time and actually do very well as a result of having their like actual PC architecture in there and doing some really cool stuff with that, even though there was some very technical competition, including a lot of people's favorite consoles, Nintendo's GameCube released this generation 
Generation, the original Xbox released this ge generation, as well as the uh, Sega Dreamcast. All three of these consoles kind of paled in comparison to the PlayStation 2, particularly when it come to came to sales, because the PlayStation 2 bundled itself the DVD player, so it could bundle, you know, it could sell to a whole new market, as well as being, you know, the successor to the most successful games console of all time up to that point. And as a result, of that it went on to be even more successful than the PlayStation with 155 million units. Which again, uh, even though the other consoles were very successful compared to their time, when you compare it to the PlayStation, they all just kind of, uh, you know, stop short. Because looking at the, uh, you know, Xbox of 24 million in second place, looking at the GameCube of 22 million, and then the Dreamcast of 9.13 million. And sadly, this was kind of the end of that Nintendo Sega rivalry. Even though they both did very poorly, the Sega, did, you know, the Dreamcast had so much invested in it and so much piracy and just so many negative things to it that it actually uh, caused the end of Sega selling consoles. And midway through this generation, they actually switched to selling games for other platforms, which is why you might have played, uh, for instance, Sonic Heroes on your GameCube or your Xbox or even your PlayStation 2, which is something I find kind of cool because even though it's really sad that the Dreamcast, which had such a, you know, kind of a massive capability, I'd say it's one of the most forward thinking consoles of all time at the point, you know, being such a, uh, you know, it, it came out before the other consoles, was just as powerful and had internet capability for the first time, which again, is something that never really picked up until the generation afterwards. Even though it had all of these features, it's a, it was kind of sad to see it go. It was kind of cool to be able to play Sega games on other platforms if you didn't own a Dreamcast, which personally I didn't, which was pretty cool. So with that said, yeah, there's a uh, Sega dropped out this generation, leaving just PlayStation, uh, leaving just Sony and their PlayStation brand, leaving Nintendo and leaving the Xbox and Microsoft behind. So this meant going into the seventh generation of consoles, it was a very, very simple thing. There wasn't this like, you know, 50 consoles released and only three were strong. It really was just three big consoles releasing and going into a big war of each other. And this was the kind of start of the console war online because the internet was growing. And this is why so many people think that this was the first generation where people generally had like that whole argument on the internet because once you picked a console, they were all expensive. It was kind of hard to pick up the other two because again, they were all incredibly expensive, which kind of led to the situation where people just bought one. And because the Wii was the cheapest of the three, the Wii generally sold the worst. But on top of that, it wasn't just the Wii being the cheapest and the Wii having the coolest gimmick. The Wii also had the advantage of selling to a brand new market in the same way that, you know, a PlayStation would be doing the past, uh, past two generations because they started selling to, you know, a particularly old people, particularly young people, and uh, they hit both the demographics at the same time and they had the best selling console Nintendo's ever had, uh, even though they had a really low attach rate because people bought it and then didn't really play it again, that it still did very, very well for Nintendo and was a massive financial success. So yeah, uh, in case you can't tell already, the PlayStation 3, the Xbox 360 and the Wii all kind of went up against each other at roughly the same time. Uh, the uh, Xbox 360 released about a year earlier and they all came out at roughly the same thing with the Wii being a little bit ahead with 102 million consoles sold worldwide. The, play, uh, the Xbox 360 being a little bit behind that, 84 million, and the PlayStation 3 selling 80 million units. Even though it got up to a super rough start, the reason if you're wondering by the way that the Sony went from being the top to the bottom is because they had the roughest start of any console generation where they had the most expensive console of all time or you know of, of uh, very recent times especially after you converted it but they had one of the most expensive consoles ever they didn't really have a very big game lineup and they launched last out of all the consoles and sadly all of these things combined to make uh, Sony go from the very top of the last generation and just redefining what it means to be a successful console again the PlayStation 2 sold the most of any console of all time and it kind of went from that to being the worst of this generation despite that though this was the most successful generation of consoles ever so many more people bought uh, this uh, generation than any other before again if you look at the first generation where 3 million was successful or even the second generation where 30 million was crazy successful all three of these generations did much much better of these consoles did much much better than that and that's something that's kind of cool as a whole this kind of launched uh, consoles into a whole new kind of realm and that was something that was quite cool and it meant that the eighth generation was put off and put off and put off again because all three you know manufacturers all had a very successful console ready why would they want to upgrade until absolutely necessary which is why the eighth generation rolled around and was kind of late to the whole thing because other you know like gaming markets had already made pretty big inroads into the console market share because uh, stuff like smartphones and tablets really had just become a big thing like smartphones weren't a thing at the time of the seventh generation launch but they definitely were at the time the eighth generation launch the same is true for pc gaming that picked up a particularly big amount and as a result of this even though nintendo uh, microsoft and sony all had brand new consoles all with their whole new ideas launching for this generation none of them has really done quite so well as the previous generation so uh, yeah first uh, launched the wii u in 2012 it just kind of had a surprise uh, launch i've done a whole video talking about why the wii u didn't do well very well but this has been nintendo's least successful console ever it's uh, you know i guess uh, you know by current standards it's not doing very well right now and uh, the same is true for the xbox one the xbox one was meant to be a continuation of their 360 brand which was a very successful console but it just hasn't really followed up to what people expect uh, because it's kind of been in a console war of the playstation 4 where the playstation 4 is widely regarded to be uh, by a lot of people to be the better console again that's that's just you know what the market's saying it's nothing to do with my opinion i quite like the xbox one but the playstation 
PlayStation 4, uh, it's funny I have to say that because there is a big console war between these people right now, but the PlayStation 4 did very well with almost 40 million sales and it's looking to continue its, you know, track record, the PS3 and the PS2 set and sell very, very, very well. But as a whole, even now, the console isn't doing too amazingly and isn't really set to, you know, set new uh, records for the generation as a whole, just kind of win it and sell a lot more than the Xbox One and the, PS uh, and the Wii U, which is really where I wanted to end today's video. It's funny because before the whole idea of consoles came out, interactive television and playing with, you know, stuff on your TV was this whole brand new concept and it really just came in more and more and more, but we might be coming towards the end of the consoles because as you, as you kind of saw through there, it was this big upwards trend throughout the whole thing until the very last generation where thing, uh, you know, this generation of consoles right now, none of them are really too popular. Like you can easily just bypass them and say, oh yeah, I'll just keep playing on my PC or I'll, I'll just keep playing on my tablet. And that's become more and more of a valid option because of the market set, uh, share of these consoles dropping, which in turn is meaning that you don't need to buy them anymore, which means their market share might drop more and more and more. Again, it's something that we're going to have to see how this develops over time, but it's something I find incredibly interesting to, at the very least. And in case you are curious who won the console war, so far it looks like Sony, which means the kind of end results of who won each generation, of all, all eight generations. Nintendo won the first one, Atari won the second, uh, uh, the second, Nintendo won the third and the fourth generation, PlayStation won the fifth and the sixth generation, Nintendo winning the seventh, and PlayStation looking like they're going to win the eighth, which means if you were to have a graph, Nintendo has therefore won the most console wars by virtue of being around the longest, with uh, PlayStation being second, and Atari being third, and Microsoft has never actually won one, which is kind of sad if you think about it, but still, that is uh, the history of the console, uh, the console wars and the console generations. I hope you did all enjoy today's video. If you did like it, please do like it and let me know. It helps out the channel a lot, and lets me do like this sort of video. And uh, besides that, I guess I'll see you all in the next one. So let me know in the comments down below if you have any thoughts you want to share about this whole thing. And besides that, I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye.